Hello everybody, uh, welcome to Northampton Film Festival 2021, kind of a big deal. Um, and thank goodness, actually, we've got some uh, people in this Q&A that are actually kind of a big deal. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome you to that. So, so we have our documentary day today. Um, we are screening uh, five documentaries, um, two of which have the involvement of Tony Klinger, who is the, the linchpin, shall we say, of this Q&A. Um, but before we get started on that, just to give you a bit of background on Northampton Film Festival, um, I run Screen Northampton, we're a social enterprise film company, um, we also run Northampton Film Festival, um, which for us is all about kind of a shop window to uh, the film industry. Um, I'm starting today with some really great news that we are extending the period in which you can watch all of those documentaries. We've had such a great reaction, and um, generally we're a, a, a drama feature film production company. Um, and we had such a great reaction to the documentaries that we're gonna extend them for the whole of the festival. So that's really exciting. So if you haven't managed to see those documentaries yet and you can't fit them in tonight, then you've got until the end of Wednesday to do it. Um, equally, we've got some other Q and A's as part of the festival. So if you'd love chatting film with us, um, we've also got um, a preview of the film called Surge, um, which is starring Ben Wishaw. Um, we've got a Q and A with the producers of that tomorrow, which is Saturday, the 15th of May. Um, and then also on Sunday, the 16th of May, we've got another Q&A um, with, uh, well, after a screening of the film Moon um, with the director, Gareth Edwards, and also the editor of that, which is Colin Gowdy, um, who's the local guy to Northampton. So there we go. So um, without further ado, I'm going to bring in all of our guests for our Q&A. We're first starting off um, with, of the two documentaries that, that Tony is involved with, we're starting off um, with a kind of panel from sisters. Um, so I'm going to bring in Tony, of course, bring you in first as I guess, um, the director, Dan Blackwell, uh, Nahid Shahlamini, and then we've also got an uber special guest. Um, we've got Zarifa, um, who is part of the orchestra that we're, the whole film is about. So I'm very excited to have you all here. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Um, so first of all, I wanted to start with where everyone is in the world. Uh, let's, I mean, let's start with Tony, who I think is probably in the most exciting location. Where are you, Tony? I'm a couple of miles from you in Northampton. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but what, Dan, I, I was trying to work out maybe where you are and I don't know at all. Uh, I'm currently in Istanbul. Ah, and then Zarifa? I'm currently in Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek. Ah, and then last but not least, Nahid. I'm in Munich, Germany. Wow. So as I say, kind of a big deal. People from all corners of the globe, which is, is amazing. I mean, we, we came up with this theme um, to be a bit tongue in cheek because we know we're just we're just little Northampton, um, you know. But if you don't believe in something, if you don't have passion for stuff, if you don't believe a little bit that you're kind of a big deal, then, you know, who will? So we're going to shout it from the rooftops. 
Um, so, actually, if anyone's got any questions for any of our panels, stick them in the comments and stuff, um, which are under either the YouTube or the Facebook, and we'll answer them live if we can. Um, so let's start right at the beginning. Um, ooh, who should we start with? So, to Tony, what was the beginning of this project for you? Beginning of this project was a, a local lady whose name is Sheila Smith. Uh, told me there's a young gentleman in this town who's put together some, he's shot some stuff and he's making a film and it's really interesting and I should meet him. And, I, and, and my initial reaction to always to that kind of thing is, oh, leave me alone. I've got enough stuff going on without another project. And then she started to tell me a bit about it. She said, you really got, you know, have a coffee with him. Um, and I did, and it's like a like a like a bromance. <laughs> I met the guy. He told me the story, and I said, "Yeah, let's let me see something." And he started to show me, and there was not a moment's doubt in my mind that we that had to help him get this film to the wider world. And and you know, I, I I'm very proud to be a participant in it. But I think most of the credit for this one. The next one, you can give me the credit if you like it. Yeah. <laughs> because I did that one. But he did most of this work. I, I've helped him spread the word, I think, and hopefully we'll do better than that. And I you know, I think it's it's a it's a very, very good film, but the subject matter is even more important than that. It's an amazingly important message, which we're gonna get to hear as we talk here, I'm sure. Um and I, I think that's what's valid. Uh but yeah, my part was kind of an en enabler but that's what film producers do isn't it uh, you know so I, I i kind of think that's what i did um, and it's it's I, I also wanted to make the point which it hasn't been said yet which i think is very relevant this is this film's world premiere and we did it in our own hometown because he's a local boy and i'm a local boy so um you know it's kind of a nice thing because it's in the right place that it should be first shown here Definitely. Yeah, no, and I, you know, I, I love, obviously, I love anything that starts in Northampton. I, I think, you know, it's the central universe. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, <laughs> um, well, so, Dan, so, yeah, I, you know, are you Northampton born and bred or? I am, yes. Uh, I was born in Northampton General Hospital. I grew up in East Tunsbury. Um, when I was uh, planning Sisters, I was living in Brixworth. Amazing. Um, and, um, Nahid, what's your involvement in this project? Um, I, I actually uh, featured Zarifa and Nagin and the orchestra in one of my books in 2017. And it's just fluke, which I don't believe in at all. And, and, we, I, and I've met Dan in the hallways now that I remember back. And I said, I've met you in, this, on, in 2017 because he was walking around and I saw a young man. I thought he was a teacher. I remember this. I thought he was a teacher. But the more that I think about it, we have met, but we just never spoke. And a, like, I think a couple of weeks ago on Clubhouse, somebody connected me and Tony. And so I'm an Afghan who, uh, who, who went through the, the whole refugee journey, the whole immigration journey, and then come back. And, and I work a lot of my projects are in Afghanistan and in, in war zones. But this, of course, I'll always have a soft spot for Afghanistan. And, and when it comes to um, the politics of, of that region, that is, you can say that I, live, I know a little bit, maybe more than, than the normal person. Uh, because my work is a lot in that field, so um, I'm here to support and ask and, and, and answer, and, and I'm so proud of this film because um, uh, the story is extremely important, especially at this time, um, at this time in my area, to bring it out. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, so so talking of the story, so Zarifa, do you want to fill us in on what Zora is? Zora is the first female orchestra of Afghanistan uh, and I was one of the conductors and I was also playing viola there. Amazing. And so, Dan, how did, how did you hear about it? What inspired you to start making um, this, this piece of music that you wanted to do with Zora? Well, to give it context, I have to say, first and foremost, I'm a musician before I'm a filmmaker. And I started a collaboration project in 2013, collaborating different musicians together. It started around the UK, and the idea was to fuse genres together. A lot of Northampton musicians have been on early four-bar tracks. Um, and in 2017, I decided to escalate it to the next level and go beyond fusing cultures and, like, well, uh, genres and things like that and start, start going to a deeper level with it and... Uh, fusing cultures together and different people, different parts of the world who have stories to tell through music. And I found out about Zora online. Um, so I decided 
to um, to compose a piece of music for them um, that I titled Sisters. Uh, so I wrote this classical piece and I sent it over to them as a video, uh, playing like a demo of the piece um, that I had composed. And um, I got in touch with them and they invited me to come over and, and record them performing it. And I decided that I couldn't just, just go over to Afghanistan and, and record a piece of music. I had to film a documentary around it and, and really bring their stories out that way. So I, um, I'd never filmed anything before. It's my first ever filming venture. I went by myself to Kabul um, with some borrowed cameras um, and a couple of microphones. And uh, I funded it on a, with a Kickstarter fundraiser. Um, and so I organized it all by myself when I was about 25, I think. Um, and when I was over there, I, I was in the right time at the right place. Um, a, lo a lot happened and the documentary came together better than I ever imagined it could. And I think part of the reason for that is that I didn't go over there with a big film crew or a lot of people. It was just me. So everything was very organic and very, very natural. Um, you know, so I think that's, that's part of what's special about this documentary is that it was very off the cuff, very on the fly, um, very low budget. Um, but it, it came together very, very nicely. Yeah, I, mean, I have convinced he does his best work low budget and with very little equipment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you you never you should uh, yeah. Um, one thing I've learned is that you should you should never deliver on a low budget because then people keep asking you to do it <laughs> as a filmmaker again. But yeah, yeah, I mean, so actually talking of Dan, was this because I remember um, in the documentary it's saying that um, you um, had borrowed a load of camera equipment and stuff. So uh, musician first, filmmaker second, and how hard is that to then try and cover something like this if you know if, if film and the equipment isn't even yours. Um, yeah, it was um, it was very very difficult. I, I'd say that planning and visualization was was the way to go with it. I planned everything very very meticulously, and um, you know made sure I, I'd thought out how how it was all going to work out, how it was all going to go. Um, you know because I, I had to be ready for any eventuality. Um, so. Yes, I, I planned it out very, very carefully. I did a lot of practicing beforehand as much as I possibly could. And um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, it, it, was, it was difficult because I was on the whole time. I was working constantly. Sometimes I had to just put a cat, I'd, I'd stop somebody, be wait, wait there, say, say that again in two seconds. Let me just set this camera up over here and, I'll, um, and we'll have this conversation again because obviously I was filming the whole thing but also featuring in the whole documentary. So it was trying also while trying to record a whole orchestra with two microphones and things like that and record all the interviews and make sure it all ran smoothly in Kabul, which is a very difficult place to stay organized. Um, when it's what people said to me over there all the time was this is Afghanistan time you know any plans that you have it's Afghanistan time now if you think your driver's turning up they're not if you think your security's going to be there and you're safe you're not you know so <laughs> that was very much the way of it but um, I learned to just roll with the punches of it and um, I think the fact that uh, I did go in there quite naively um, was was a very good thing because um you know, it, 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 everybody was very relaxed. You know, it, there wasn't all these cameras in their faces or anything. We got to connect on a very human level. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really glad it happened the way it did. In future, I would like to have a full crew with me. Um, I think <laughs> my days of going to, uh, to to war zones by myself uh, with a rucksack yeah. are, you know, are, are done. They're, they're behind me, I think. Um, you know, 29 now, getting on a bit. Got to be careful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, well, Nahid, talking about, um, you know, knowing Afghanistan, I mean, when... How how hard is it to get a film crew into Afghanistan and to film the kind of things that obviously Dan was filming? For a young British uh, uh, man, very difficult, especially to go in, in and try to film. That's why I said I've told him so many times and I'll say it, truly praise you for the courage that you had uh, to go there in a place like that, in a, con in a con very, very conservative, uh, traditional culture um, and, and filming filming a matter that is already controversial 
for women to go and do music, which is traditionally and and even before the wars, before the forty years of wars in Afghanistan, this has this was this was something that was people were very careful with. You know, women touching music and singing and all of that stuff is still considered very very you know unhonorable to a certain degree. So uh, that to, for him to be to to do that and all on his on his own, that's why I, I you know we've been on a pan, a couple of panels before, and I said. Uh, seriously, I wish that we had just stopped and said hello that day, and then we could have, you know, I could have maybe helped him and and stay, it's, you know, just connect him with people because it is it is extremely dangerous. You know, first of all, you can't have a camera in front of you and in, in your hand, even me, because I look European, so they think that I am a European, so I become a target number one. But but a, but a, but, a, but a young man, oh um, Gottes will, that he, he he how dare he go in in a group of young women. And all of them are in a in a music institute, which does not have a lot of security. The the, war, the walls are kind of you know a little bit um, uh, compounded, but it is not secure at all because these walls are not doubled and they're not bulletproof. So if a single tiny little bomb would would blow it up, and and it does happen, it does happen in Afghanistan very very much. But for for Dan to do that, and the story is so 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 important to come out, especially this unifying voice of music creativity as a whole. And to me, as an Afghan um, activist who who sits on a couple of committees that that is dealing with the peace process in the behind the scene and and, and knows the nitty gritties of things that the media doesn't necessarily know about, we we have to you know we have we we deal with this all the time, especially when it comes to women's rights, which is one of the pillars, only one of the pillars of the human rights. Now, you are you you are talking about a place like Afghanistan, where the Taliban are supposed to come back. And the first thing that they're going to be doing most probably is to cut music off. And that is for the whole of Afghanistan. This is what they have. They have. I mean, if you, if you look at history, you know, I always say, go to the history, do your homework and find out what has happened and they will do the same thing. And that is the danger right now. And I don't think that it only affects Afghanistan, but it affects the whole region politically, of course, but it affects the dignity of the woman. That, that basic right of just wanting to be creative and you are shunned out of that, that part is completely taken away from you. So I know that from my own experiences, from my own, from my own um, you know, uh, uh, cultural and traditional, um, um, I always say, uh, contradictions that I've had, the love and hate relationship that I have. But, uh, but the story is extremely important for the outside world. Inside Afghanistan, people know them. And and also like you know they've been in Carnegie Hall they've been in Europe they've 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 had so many wonderful wonderful concerts all over the world but the right now at this moment in time when we have the, the withdrawal has started politically in Afghanistan and the last twenty years have been you know these these kids are these I, I call them kids because Nagin is, is was twenty years old when when that interview happened when I interviewed her she was nineteen I think and and you're talking about kids that have been born like either during the Taliban regime or right after post Taliban regime. So, and, and 64% approximately of the country is under the age of 27. So you're talking about a, a completely new generation that only saw, yes, war, but a lot of freedoms as well through the international community and all of these programs that came. And now all of a sudden we're taking it all away from them. And of course their lives are in danger and they will be in danger if they continue. Which, yeah, you know, I, I find so hard to, to kind of comprehend. I was talking about this with Tony in, in uh, one, our little pre-chat about just not, I think, being able to comprehend what it might be like to have, to, to live a life like that, either such a, a sheltered life. And I mean, Tony, in your introduction, um, you know, you were saying about why this for you is such an important story to tell. Um, and I don't know if you want to kind of say why you, you know, were so kind of drawn, I mean, who wouldn't be drawn to this story, but... Yeah, I, uh, well, I think that from my perspective, I mean, it just it just it's it's a story that is of today. I mean, completely in a negative way. It, it, as you've heard from Nahid, we have the incoming Taliban sort of takeover um, back, back to back to the future. It's it's going going to go back. Uh, it's going to get worse, um, and you have a situation in which is volatile to say the least where you had last week uh, and i got the number changed it i it, it almost has doubled uh, I, I think it's 108 young Some, something in that yes something, something in, in that, that region of girls got blown up for going to school last week i'm not talking about something 20 years ago last week um and 
these people who are playing these instruments, these girls, young women, uh, you have to put it in context. The thing that, um, I don't know if you've even seen the film, but if you see the film, the thing that's obvious is how unlike other girls and young women anywhere in the world they are. Yeah. Yeah, it's so unbelievably so, yeah. which is, ob I mean, obviously, because we're all human and this is the whole point of it, but but yeah, it's so obviously so, it's ridiculous. And and their humanity shines up, as does their almost surreal bravery. I mean, I, I, it, it, if somebody said to me, I mean, I, I, I say it from a, I live in a demo democracy where everything's kind of nice. If somebody said to me, if you don't stop writing and making films tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. I kind of take it for a joke, but in this place, they actually do it. And 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 then even if I can get my head around that, they then say, and if you don't stop and you're not scared of me, we're going to come and kill your sister and your mother and your brother, and we're going to roll a, 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 blow up your car with your father in it. That is another kind of how do you deal with that? And that's what they're facing. These people are unbelievable because they are so human and so much like us, so much they're, they're just the same as everybody else. And the fact that some of them have now had to have no alternative really but to leave the country to flee, it's just awful. It's just awful. The whole lives are being dictated because they want to play some music. They want to have that freedom. And that, so that's what this is about. This is about more than music or some girls in a music academy. This is about freedom. Yeah, I mean, you're you're right that it's 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 incom it's it's so incomprehensible in many ways. I mean, Dan, obviously, obviously, we follow you throughout this whole um, the whole film. But I mean, having um, I mean, when actually, when did you when were you out there and when were you shooting it? It was uh, 2017, which is a, a very difficult time to go. It was a very um, rough time in Afghanistan. There were a lot of uh, bombings going on. Um, it was, I think, a time when the German embassy was bombed, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Nahid, um, the, the particularly bad uh, Um So, yes, it was, it was a couple of years ago now. Um, and s since that's happened, a, a lot's changed. Um, a lot of the members of Zora have had to flee. Um, so it's not the same orchestra. It, it, it was. I, 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 um, but I, I think that I, I'm very, very glad that the um, I'm very glad that the documentary is coming out now. I'm glad that it's taken a long time to to get everything together um, in order for it to be released now, because I think now is the most important time for it to be coming out. With everything that's happening in Afghanistan right now, the film is now more relevant than than it's ever been, than it ever could have been. So. Um, I'm extremely glad that it's it's taken until it has for it to be premiered. Um, and yeah. Well, I was going to ask, obviously, you know, what um, kind of thoughts on on yeah on on what how how life has been since you were out there, and also then what you hope that it might achieve. Obviously, it raises awareness if people are watching this about what's going on. But is there anything? I mean, uh, and then maybe this is also a question from the heat as well. But raising awareness, where where is that is that enough? What do we what do we have to do with that? I think it's extremely important to have a dialogue going on. You know, a, a dialogue is everything, and the more we can educate and understand ourselves, uh, understand for ourselves um, how other people think, how other people are around the world, um, the, the more the more we can make change. The more people know about something. Um, that, that that it has to do good, doesn't it? You know, if, if people are watching, if people know, if people can relate and if people can empathize with people in Afghanistan, then more and more people might start to care. Um, and the more people that care, the, the louder the voice gets. And, um, you know, the, the the more good, I believe, can be achieved. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, Nahid, Nahid, yeah, you've got, a, you, um, I just, um, I didn't read out actually your biography and you, you have such a huge list of things that you do, but obviously <laughs> activism is, is is one of those, obviously. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, how how do we act on this, I suppose, is probably the, the big question. Yeah, um, sorry, my mic is going crazy right now. I don't know if you can hear me properly, but... Um, um, oh, yes, no, we can hear you fine. No, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> um, I think I'll just add and not repeat what Dan said, because I agree completely with it, but... In addition to that, I think it is so important for us 
um, to stand in solidarity for these such human rights because we're not only this does not only concern Afghanistan but rather mm -hmm. you know the basic rights of humanity that can be taken away from you with a click like that and we take it so I find that, that we 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 think that we have gotten these rights you know especially young people that they they wake up and they think that this has always been like this it has not we have fought for every single every single freedom that we have in the Western world as well and it is so fragile if we don't you know if you don't if we don't protect it and and I think we still have a long way to go as women all over the world not only in Afghanistan but of course Afghanistan you know you're talking about the whole region being at, at stake you're talking about the Afghanistan 20 years ago was only with Taliban today we have 22 extremist groups now we're only talking about the Taliban here so are we are we going back with the Sharia? Yes, okay, philosophy, whatever, whatever, whoever is, has, everybody has the right to, to think whatever they want, but not to force others to do that what they want. And that will, will kind of overflow in the whole region. And the danger that I see is that the Afghan government does not have the strong military, you know, equipment and know-how and the force, the strength to fight you know, whether it's a civil war that may occur or whether a, a takeover, that, that becomes very difficult. And what do you think is going to happen if, if we, we, we allow such extremism and this kind of lifestyle to, to, have, a, to have a country? I mean, they, they will, if, if they, the one thing that we have to protect, I always say, is the constitution of Afghanistan, not only for Afghanistan, for the whole world and for all of women, for this whole gender. Because under that constitution, me and everybody on this panel are allowed to go and fight for these rights. But if those clauses are changed, none of us can because a sovereign state does not allow you to do that and you have to abide by their laws and therefore you will be considered a criminal. So this has a lot, very, very deep and complex root to it and the effects of that will affect the whole world. And, and we should not, we should not, I, and, I, and I agree with Dan, we should not just sit and accept certain things and make as much noise as possible because the mainstream media is busy with all of the other wars. These are the tiny little things that go through the grapevines and get lost, but it has the hugest impact on half the population of this world. So it's it's really, really important, I think. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've, I've seen talking of making noise, you know, I've seen a lot um, since, you know, we decided to show this um, film that there's a lot going on um, with press and publicity around this, um, this film. And I mean, um, I mean, Tony, where do you see this kind of going and what, what is hopefully the, the legacy of this uh, film? I think what's going to happen is the first, the first thing I'd like to say is, and I totally think that what Nahid and Dan are saying is absolutely 100% right. But as a film, thinking about it as a film for a second, as a documentary, it very much gives the flavour, I don't know if it was called Italian, but the Garden of the Finzi Contini, where there was like a part of Italy where this little family were living amongst the rise of fascism, but inside the little place, inside their little world, everything was kind of carrying on like normal. And this feels like that. It, when you're watching the film, I want to make the point, it's actually a lovely film. It's lyrical, it's informative, it's charming, and, and everything about it is just smashing. And it's only when you start hearing the depth of these interviews that Dan conducts with Zarifa and, and, and her colleagues, that you start to realise, oh my word, this is like a really sick, this is a real issue, this is something terribly important. Up to then it's just a very lovely film and it, and it can play like that, you can look at it two ways. And it's the messaging, obviously, you know, we, we mustn't get to a point where we just forget that it's actually something to watch. It's, it, it has that merit. Where it go now? We're going to go in more festivals. We're going to go in Atlanta next next month um, uh, and the following month. We're going to be going to other festivals. I can't announce yet because uh, it's not official, but we have been invited. In fact, today we got invited to another one. Um, and that's wonderful. And we've also been invited on to 27 digital platforms, but we haven't done that deal yet because we want to see where we can go with this. Um, yeah, we've waited this long, we've gone through COVID, <laughs> we might as well <laughs> do the best yeah. we can do. Uh, but I think it has, you know, sometimes you're involved with something, I've been involved with some big films, and, and some of them had 
big legs, as it were. They they could be marketed and they you know they did very well. And sometimes you're involved with something and you go like, wow, this is really going to resonate with people. It's really important. This is one of those films. This is has that ability to be more than itself. It's like the sum of the parts are bigger than the individual sections. And you know, I I kind of stumbled on it. I, I at least I could see the, the thing for what it was almost immediately. And I think it could it could be have an effect on a lot of people, you know, and and that in itself, you know, and I don't mean how much money we make. I mean that we need to make money to make more films, obviously. But in terms of it could resonate with people in their heart. And and I think, you know, what more can you ask for from making a film? I mean, that's, that's what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, so actually going back to the music, I mean, um, obviously, we kind of saw to the end of your visit, Dan. Um, but what's 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 happened to that piece of music, and and what's the kind of the future around the mu the musical kind of aims of this? Yeah, that's um that's a good question. Uh, first of all, I, could I just add on to um, what Tony was saying about the film? Uh, in the because we've been, talked about quite a lot of doom and gloom. I just want to say for anybody who hasn't seen the film yet, it's not a miserable. Um, you know, it's it's not a very dark constantly this heavy heavy film it's a lot of it's very light-hearted a lot it'll make you laugh it'll make you smile um there there are moments that may make you tearful um there are moments that may move you there are parts that will certainly make you angry as well um but there are certainly a lot of parts that are that will will i think i want viewers of this film to really come up feeling very wholesome you know that there should be a very Everybody who I've spoken to has seen it has come away from it with a very positive feeling rather than a very negative feeling. I think that's very important to stress as well, um, alongside all of the the seriousness and and the, and the dark sides of of the whole situation surrounding the film. Um, as with the music, um, essentially, I guess it's once the film's been released uh, through a broadcaster and everything. Um, I guess that would be a whole campaign releasing the piece of music as well. Um, and you know, maybe we could drum up some kind of some kind of charity with sales from that or something. Um, that that would be that would be very interesting. Um, I'd be very interested as well in w working with Zora again in the future, um, and working with all the musicians who fled and working with them remotely um, to do maybe another collaboration piece to follow up on this documentary. We'll, we'll see what things lead to, um, but I'm certainly open to to all all ideas like that. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely going to say, um, you're right, we have talked about, I mean, obviously huge, huge, serious issues, but um, you're right, that, yeah, the, the documentary is, is very enjoyable, it's really interesting to see, you know, instruments that, um, you know, it was, it was great to see a viola, which I, you know, I'm very familiar with, with that, and then instruments that I, I can't remember the names of, but, um, um, and I think I was going to, I was going to kind of maybe end this, but we're, we're a bit early, that's fine, so I'm not going to end it, but um, just to talk about, yeah, I mean, I assume, you know, obviously, the, what's great about the film is there's lots about the history of you know a rich cultural life in Afghanistan um and and we talked earlier about um you know kids playing like kids play and and all of that stuff which is so positive and I don't know if if the you want to kind of uh, jump in with anything about you know about I think yes some, some positives because I'm sure and, and we've lost obviously Zarifa because sure. of her internet um you know but um, I'm sure equally there was, is lots of love for the culture of, of, of certain aspects of Afghanistan as well. For sure, for sure. The, the, I mean, music has always been a part of Afghan culture traditional, uh, traditionally as well. It has been very loved, it's been very, uh, very much played in every single household. Not with women necessarily. I mean, women listen to it and and listen to it, and they don't they didn't often. But it's just like when it's it's family gatherings or very private gatherings, then the women you know get together and then do it together. But like that in a, in, a, in an open gathering, it was never the case, and never never never. I don't think it would be um, either, uh, even today outside of Afghanistan. But um, what is what is what is very important to 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 note is that Afghanistan has gone through so many different civilizations. So whether it was the the, the big Buddhas that were you know also um, you know d destroyed by the Taliban during their reign, um, or or the you know we have over five thousand archaeological sites in Afghanistan that that date to five thousand years ago and 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 things like that. You know, there's a lot of it's a very rich culture. Almost every civilization has passed through it from Alexander to to everybody. And, and that is also 
um, um, you know, it's it's trying to teach the Afghans as well about their roots and their cultures and this, these different civilizations and different religions that have passed through it. And at the same time, to show the world that there is a parallel life through, especially with, when it comes to, to, to the sister's um, story, there's a parallel life that happens in Afghanistan that has flourished in the past two decades that we don't show enough of. And yes, there's a war, there's a horrific war, there's a lot of suppression, name it, all of the things that we know and we hear about Afghanistan, it is true, but it's one-sided. That's what I want to say. There's 95% of it is true. But why don't we always show those 95%? Why can't we show the other 5% so that it would inspire others that watch it? It would inspire a person that is having a difficulty making a decision as, as to go, oh, should I do music or should I not do music? If they can do it without any resources, with a war going on, with, with death threats every single day, not only from, from their own, from, from the war, but from their families also, and, and they have no resources, none whatsoever, they get to do it. What, how is that? It's it's because of the hunger. It's because of the the the, the fact that freedoms are, are taken away from you, and then all of a sudden this this survival instincts instinct triggers in you, and all of a sudden you're you're able to do it. Anybody can do it, and that is a huge it's inspirational, you know, vibe or, or or power. There's a lot of power in this, in these stories that you can give to the whole world, and people you know people can 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 carve into their own potential and become the best. Um, the best in whatever they want to do, not only in music, it's in any creative field. So it's it's a it's a it's a, it's it's really important, as Dan mentioned, to really focus on those parts as well, because the idea of these documentaries is to do, to document and inform, but also to inspire. Absolutely, and yeah, yeah, I think it definitely watching something like that definitely, you know. It kicks me and goes, "Come on, you know, I've, I've I've got a lot of tools at my disposal, and I should absolutely be making the most of them." And um, Zarifa, I think we have you back, even though we don't have picture potentially. But um, I mean, we we're just talking about the positives, and I don't know whether you kind of want to, if if you can hear me all right, whether um, you've got any comments about um, kind of what you hope this documentary might bring, and also I don't know some anything positive about the kind of Afghan culture and and things. I know that obviously you've had to kind of flee Afghanistan, but I assume there's lots of fond memories as well. Gonna see if that works. I'm not sure if she can hear me. <laughs> it's a long way to be fair. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll, I will, ah, uh, oh, no, 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 internet. Um, but to be fair, touch wood, I'm gonna touch lots of wood. We've been pretty lucky so far. Um, but, um, oh, what should I go on to? So, well, yeah, so, I mean, um, I was going to kind of say because we've, we've, we've I've got quite a lot of questions. We've talked a lot about loads of different things um, and and not answered some of these. So that's that's amazing. And we'll have to come back and do session two at another time. Um, so I suppose the big thing will be what are you what what and um, what are you all kind of going on to kind of next? What's what's the either what you're doing with this project next or the next project and how. Um, I mean, maybe we start with Dan. I mean, um, I know obviously originally there was there was kind of lots of ideas about what where else you might go with a similar kind of ethos. Uh, yes, that's very much still there. We want to um, do a whole series of these documentaries uh, all over the world, from with all kinds of different issues, different cultures, anywhere where there's any kind of uh, division or difficult situations that people are stuck in where they're using music as a tool to get out of those difficult places or to unite people who maybe may have been at war for so long to show the humanity it's, it's, it's essentially a an artistic and a humanitarian project it, it shows the humanity of people through music um and the importance of expression and the importance of culture and how how everybody can can kind of come together um and, and how music can be used as a positive to to end war, and fighting, and poverty, and all the negative things in in life, you know. Um, so that's that's the plan, and I have I have a lot of ideas uh, for different documentaries in the bank. Well, I mean, so bringing it back to kind of the filmmaking process, and um, what yeah, what I know, obviously, I would imagine that every different kind of country or situation you come into will be completely different. But what have you kind of learned about the filmmaking process that you'd like to change next time? As we're a film company, we're always intrigued in these things. Um, as I said before, I'm very glad that I went alone to Afghanistan and captured everything the way I did because it really, really got got the humanity of the girls out there. And and I'd like to say as well, I, I think. 
that th there are some things that are said in this documentary that are absolutely mind blowing from from these women um, that would just make your jaw drop and, and, and make your, your eyes tear up. But it's it's also almost just as powerful just to see all the children at the school just playing together and running around. And honestly, it feels like any school in the world is it's so relatable. Um, and just the, the way they, they behave, the way they talk, the way they make jokes, it, it, it brings you right there. Because I'm there so sort of naively and just a musician from Northampton, you can kind of join me there and be in Afghanistan and really be in that scene with me through this film. Um, so, the, the it, but in future films, I would certainly like to have a crew around me. I'd like to have a team. I would like to be in a position where there's somebody um, doing all the planning for me of where, where my next moves will be and how I'll be safe and my security, rather than me organizing that with a camera in one hand and microphone in the other whilst, while trying to interview somebody um, would be preferable, I would say. Well, I mean, Tony, I, I assume in, in your career, you've filmed in some quite, uh kind of mad places around the the world. Um, got any ridiculous uh, stories about, uh, I don't know, culture clashes, things going wrong? <laughs> many, many, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you get to a certain age, and I, you know, I don't try and make excuses for myself, where you say, right, Dan, where's the next one you're gonna do? <laughs> and yes, we'll find ways to give him all the things he wants, but I will be going to the south of France or California or those kind of locations, because uh, I, I I, I suppose I did those kind of things. I've done those kind of things. I've been on Malibu with Keith Moon driving the wrong way down the Pacific Coast Highway at 100 miles an hour. And it's a thing you remember. <laughs> it, it, uh, those kind of things uh, stay with you. Or I, I, I remember filming in Africa where uh, I, I was on a raft trying to save some people who said they could swim and they couldn't swim. And the, it was a giant raft, a big, huge raft. And it rolled over me and hit me and smacked my, broke my ribs each time it went over until it put me back into the beach. And I was lying on the beach, with, unable to breathe. And the second unit director came over to me and says, OK, Tony. And I went, oh, it's a good next shot's over here. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've done my uh, share of those kind of things, uh, bitten by scorpions, um, all, all kinds of things have happened to me, uh, but I, 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 I will do what Dan needs to get him to do those films because I think that they're very valid. I think his his message is 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 an honest one. I mean, we we do all kinds, as you know. I think Becky, we do other kinds of films. Some we're going to talk about. We've got this is one of four documentaries we have at various stages um, at the moment, and we have feature films coming uh, that we're involved with and i write books so i i have a wide range but like dan and like nahid in the end uh, how we dress it up we're storytellers all of us you too becky we're all storytellers we might come at it from different routes and find different ways to to do that but in the end the essence of us is we want to tell a story um and it's because sometimes you find the story that just is important and uh, this this is one of those stories this is an important story I, I was we were doing the online edit as you know becky about three in the morning the other night <laughs> uh, yeah. we, we, it got very late and i was shooting the next day and it was like crazy and so i got a couple of hours sleep and i we showed the, the young lady who was tamara is her name who was working on the online edit and she literally was laughing and crying as she was watching it it from from the, the emotional impact of it she's a professional young lady it was, it, she didn't have to do that it was really a genuine reaction sometimes you're involved in something it's bigger than you and this is one of those films so I, i'm very proud to be involved i'm proud of all the people that got involved in people like Nahid uh, who have well bent over backwards is hardly the expression who've really helped get this word out to uh, all over the world i mean this is <laughs> from little northampton it, it literally we were just on a clubhouse talk we had people from canada america all over the world i mean literally all over the world um and i think that's fantastic that a thing like this started off by a bunch of loonies in northampton <laughs> can go everywhere like that because it's important that it can it's, that we've got a bigger reach i think that's fascinating well, 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, as it all starts here. But um, I mean, and actually, was talking of the edit. I mean, was um, I don't know how much kind of footage you came back with, Dan. How hard was it to get rid of lots of stuff or kind of put this together once you've just lived it into a you know into a digestible story? Um, I think uh, it was it was somewhere in the realm of a hundred hours of footage. I think. Um, <laughs> That I, yeah, uh, <laughs> I had to, to work through because I, I was wearing GoPros and um, I was setting up time lapses. I had a 360 camera as well. Uh, so I've got some sort of virtual reality footage over there, um, which I need to sort out to get that edited and everything. Um, it was it was a very long process. I, um, I got home, I had all the footage and I, uh, I, I think I worked on it straight for about four days. Uh, and nights and I just just worked and worked and worked just kept on running with it because there was there was so much um there, there was so much that I, I just I, I had to do it as fast as I could almost do you know what I mean and I had to try not to be too picky but then I went through it again and again and again and honestly it's been four years of redrafts and redrafts of this film um this must be about draft 60 by now um you know and I bet there's going to be future drafts to come before it's actually finally finished um but yeah it, it was it was a hell of a process editing it and also editing something i was very new to as well i did the whole thing on iMovie um, which a lot of people wow. would would be just cringing to hear i know um but you know i don't think I, it matters i think you know it's, it's just as long as you, you know um like uh, as long as you get it out i don't think it matters to you know it, it's about the story yeah. isn't it it's not about how you got there it doesn't matter if it was really messy or whatever as long as it's there at the end exactly exactly um yeah yeah I, I, the way I saw it was I didn't have the time to to learn new software to to edit it. I just had to do it with what I did, and then at some point it'll get passed on, as it has now, um, to a media team who will put it into Final Cut and do all the do the do the next level stuff with it. You know. Yeah, actually, that's quite interesting, and maybe this will be my last question. But I mean, um, I don't know, Tony. Like, how how important did you feel that actually i mean you know is it important that actually dan is the the author the author of at least the you know the whatever the 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 bulk of the story even if you know maybe he isn't an editor is, you know he's using iMovie um i use occasionally at windows movie maker but i am not allowed near anything technological as you can probably tell from this <laughs> uh, I, I can honestly say that of all the people i've dealt with over a long period of time Dan is probably the most receptive, sponge-like person I've met. And I mean that in a very positive way. You tell him something and he takes it in. And he, 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 you don't need to tell him five times. And I did make, I'm, I'm, I'm a ruthless editor and a ruthless uh, producer in that I make people do the best they can do. Um, and I, I did make him do a lot of editing, a lot of work. Because we have to done, and we, you know, that refined things carries a lot to uh, the public see it. And I think it's worked. I think the, the work he did between this that you're seeing and what it was to begin with is is a is a is a is a big check, is a big step forward. And I I give him the full credit because he literally it's it's so easy to say, Oh, it's too hard, I'm tired tonight, I, I can't do that. Oh, what you're asking me. I mean, I was getting him to do stuff uh, through the, my associates at the at our production end from Istanbul Airport or somewhere. <laughs> he was, he was, <laughs> I was, and I was, I, not for one second did I think, oh no, he won't be able to do that. I just, you know, I said, you know, we need, this is what we need. And I said, just tell him what you need. And <laughs> he did it. He did it. I, it was like miraculous because it, it's like, nine tenths night now 90 percent, 99 percent of the people would go i can't do it i've got to wait till i get there i've got to get the thing i haven't got a plug for the thing i can't get the computer working i can't do this he didn't say that once not once he just found a way of doing it and i i hugely commend him for that and that's one of the reasons I, I, i'm looking forward to working with him again because that's lovely the relationship of production and creativity that you can actually got reasons why you can do things not reasons why excuses why you can't do things he's, he's that guy he can he can do stuff brilliant Thank well yeah I, <laughs> I look forward to to more northampton collaboration um well we're going to switch over now 
um, to Tony's second film that is screening at the festival. But you can, if you're watching this live, um, you can watch uh, Sisters up until Wednesday, the uh, 19th of May, which is the end of the festival. Um, obviously, I'd massively recommend it, which is why we're showing it. It's a premiere. It's the first time you can see it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really important film. And as you say, also a really enjoyable film, because um, that's just obviously so important to why we all um, watch film. To, you know, we want to, I think we all want to, connect with people and we all equally though want to just hear brilliant stories with brilliant people and yeah so thank you very much so thank you very much Nahid and Dan I'm going to say goodbye to you now thank you um, take care Becky. And, uh, yeah keep us up to date with with where it's going around the world and everything else absolutely brilliant cheers thank you very much and so yeah on to um, the the man who got Carter. So I'm going to bring in our, our other guests now. Um, so we've got um, filmmaker, local filmmaker, I should say, Paul Martin, as you know, and Colin Vaines, um, who I believe is the, oh, oh dear, I'm trying to multitask. I shouldn't talk and press buttons at the same time. <laughs> that is why I don't do editing, everybody. <laughs> um, but yes, welcome, um, Colin and Paul, um, to our, yeah, the man who got Carter. So also obviously showing um, at Northampton Film Festival. Um, and again, um, I think the, the online was finished um, very recently. So it's, yeah, very exciting to see it. Um, well, so first of all, should we start with, um, obviously, Tony, we know your role. Um, but um, Paul, should we start with you kind of introducing your role in, in The Man Who Got Carter? Um, I, I'm the editor and partial film partial uh, photographer for Man Who Got Carter because Tony and I traveled the country at various times going around and interviewing people together um, and it became a really interesting story to tell as it unfolded to follow someone else's passion and slowly weave that together into the telling of a story um, and then we had phenomenal support I can remember Colin at an early showing of it turning around to me and going film's okay but you haven't got an ending yet have you um, uh, and having that kind of professional input into it as well. Um, and, and my favorite moment of the whole film was a day that I went filming without Tony, and I went to every house that Michael had lived in in London, one after the other, and ended up at the cemetery where he was buried. Yeah. And that became, I, I then felt a real connection with the story we were telling. It wasn't someone else's story. It partly became mine as well. Um, but like I, I watched early stages of, of Dan's film that, that we said before, and there is a great advantage as a documentary filmmaker to be the person that both films and edits because you understand the material in more depth or to have a director with you who's filmed it who works very, very closely with you. Uh, in it and that enables the the storytelling to have more depth I often think yeah definitely I mean and obviously Colin we've, we've seen if anyone who's seen the film will have seen you in it but um, I believe you you had another role as well um, yeah I the, the Tony very kindly asked me to get involved as an executive producer and uh, I was I have to say I was extremely flattered and pleased to be doing that I have a very <laughs> I had a very long relationship with Michael back in the past which started rather strangely and it's uh, it's a wonderful story because as you can see you can tell how long ago it is I, I met Michael originally he sat in the next chair to me in a barber's shop in uh, Soho that was how we first encountered each other so we weren't trimming our beards at that time I tell you but um, I'd been a huge fan I mean that the, I was a kind of absolute film nut from the time that I was very young. Um, and the first book I bought on cinema was uh, Carlos Claren's An Illustrated History of Horror Movies. And the second book I bought on cinema was The Cinema of Roman Polanski because BBC Two showed Knife in the Water, Repulsion and Cul-de-Sac. And I must have been about, I don't know, 12 or something like that, 13. And I was just blown away i mean by by those three films and uh, and really kind of obsessed about cul-de-sac in particular which i thought was remarkable so that sort of like being the nerdy little film person that i am that that led me on a kind of a like oh well, that's interesting so those two british films by polanski were produced by this guy michael klinger how interesting or whatever 
for, you know, obviously, you know, time's going on or whatever. And I see, and I, I loved Get Carter, and I go, oh my God, that's produced by the same guy that produced Repulsion and Cul de Sac. So long before I was involved in the business, I was really like a huge fan of the work that Michael had done. Um, and then I became a film journalist when I was like 19 or so. I joined Screen International. And shortly after that, I met Michael in the next, in the adjacent barber's chair at, on uh, not just off Wardour Street, a little barber's that was there. Uh, and we shared the same barber, Wolfie, a great character. And Michael, of course, was, you know, I, I guess I just started chatting to him and there was this hilariously funny guy that's so full of life and ebullience and brilliance or whatever and started chatting to him and then went, oh my God, that's Michael Klinger who produced three of my favourite films. Um, and we just, we, we never really saw each other outside of that. It's such a bizarre sort of thing. But it was like a really you know, a really important meeting for me. And when I started out in, I mean, I'd always intended when I, that I was obsessed with films from the time I was five. And when I was 10, we saw that our English teachers read us the book of A Matter of Life and Death, the Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger film. And that was my road to Damascus thing. And then my big sort of like obsessions after that were Hitchcock and Polanski very early on. And for a long time, I thought I wanted to become a director or something. That was, I thought that if I could get into write about films, maybe other things would follow. And I was always thinking about directing, but actually because I ended up working in film project development and script development, that there was a kind of almost in an odd kind of way. And I was working for companies like British Screen and so on. There was a natural progression towards production and what I found interesting was that there were certain people who uh, I realized were exceptional at what they did and that had a, a combination of things and as time went on and of course I was very lucky to meet Tony early on I think we interviewed each other at the time of heavy metal <laughs> I kind of did an interview with you and uh, we got to know each other a little bit around that time but it was always, for, when, when I looked at kind of what Michael had done, I was just really, and, and now I have the perspective, having become a producer and made films, that what I see that he did was truly remarkable. Because to be good at raising the money for a film is one thing. To be good at actually physically line producing a film, being on top of it in that way is one thing. To be someone who's great creatively and recognizing talent and how you put things together is another thing. To find someone who has all three things is really quite remarkable because there aren't a lot of producers in the industry worldwide who are capable of doing that. And Michael had that in spades. So for me, that was, uh, now I look back on it, I feel I was so blessed to know him um, and I'm still blown away by the quality of the work that he was that he did. And to move seamlessly from genre to genre in the way that he did and recognize that I wouldn't particularly, I mean, I'm not particularly interested in sacred comedies or whatever. But what I loved was the fact that Michael embraced that and actually made, because he was really involved, as we know, with the first Confessions film, and increasingly he felt like they were losing the plot, that they were not doing what they did. I mean, that, that he worked on the first film with a really fantastic director, Val Guest. Uh, and I think that he recognised the quality that you, could, that you could have with a really good director for that kind of genre material. So even in that level, I'm really impressed by what he was doing there. Plus, his ambition to make bigger films like Gold and A Shout at the Devil or whatever. So I, 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 I'm in awe of what he did. And apart from anything else, on top of all of that, he was one of the funniest people I ever met. And I think that to be able to have that incredible Falstaffian life force uh, about you is like a big thing. And, and the final thing I would say is as a dedicated cigar smoker, he was a great inspiration in that area as well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it it really does come across. I I think, like you say, that he had that he had all of those things. And I think you're right. Um, but, you know, I'm I'm relatively only starting out in the film industry, really. But yeah, you don't you don't meet people that have that you can do the on the ground stuff and raise the money. You know, 
there's a lot of people who are lawyers that might be able to option something. You have a lot of people. I've met over the years many people who are brilliant at just simply, as the old saying goes, getting the elephants to Croydon or what, what you know, doing that physical work to do that. But that thing of the the, the taste factor. I mean, like here's a guy who recognizes in Polanski somebody of absolutely extraordinary ability knife in the water is still a masterpiece in my in my view and to recognize that here's somebody who's really exceptional and of course what Polanski really wanted to make was the film that became cul-de-sac um, which was called waiting for cattle back at the time but Michael and his partner Tony Tenser who were who were again because Michael was always thinking commercially he wasn't just thinking purely artistically it was like how can you make this thing work commercially so obviously that would have been a difficult film to make as their first film but then for for Polanski to say oh I've got this other idea about a girl who's you know kind of on her own in Kensington and she's slightly going mad or whatever and recognizing here's a genre base to produce something remarkable and then not only that this is very important to back, even though it, it was a great cost for him because it was a tough decision and because Polanski was difficult. He was, Polanski held out for the exceptional. He held out for Gil Taylor to light it, who'd shot Hard Day's Night and Doctor Strange Love and so on. He wanted Catherine Deneuve, who was a great star in, in Europe. The, you know, you know, the initial instinct, and I think this was much more from Michael's partner and Tony would, would tell me, but I, I suspect from Tony Tenser's point of view, they've got to deal with Francesca Annis, who was then, you know, kind of like a, not the, the actress she became, but she'd been in a couple of the Compton films or whatever. There was pressure always to go with a lower level of things. And Michael recognised that this was something exceptional and it was worth backing. Now, in the end... He also knew, which is I also respect as a producer, that there was a line that you had to, that you couldn't go beyond. Polanski was such an obsessive that of course he went over budget and schedule. Of course there were problems because of that. Of course in the end, Stanley Long came in to finish the film when they could, you know, when Gil Taylor couldn't stay on and they couldn't afford to keep Gil Taylor on as well for that matter, probably. But the point is, he was respectful of Polanski's vision, but he was also realistic about what the film was likely to cost and what it would be. And I think that that battle, I call it a battle in a way because I've encountered it myself. As a producer, you want to respect your, your director. You want to respect the creativity. You also want to respect your shareholders and your investors and all those people and make that work as well. And he had the ability to straddle both those things. And because Repulsion was so successful that that meant, okay, you can now make your crazy esoteric art project, whatever you want to see it as in cul-de-sac. But he knew there was already a base of people that had bought the first film that he could sell that film on. Also, the first film had had success at festivals. It had already been successful at Berlin. So Cul-de-sac, when it got made, could then be launched as a festival film and launched in that way. And that, to me, is just like an incredible thing to do. Absolutely. And um, actually, I should say, so for anyone who's joined us, um just for the, the, the man who got Carter. Um, you can um, ask the questions if you put comments, if you're watching this live um, on the, the Facebook um, or the YouTube underneath the um, live video. Um, but actually I wanted to, so just going back to what you're saying about meeting in, in Soho, I mean, it struck me, you know, is Soho, you know, a, a, a huge character in um, kind of Michael's life? And I know Colin, obviously yeah. you're massively passionate about Soho as well. Soho, you know, is, is a... Well, yeah, I'm sitting I mean, in Soho at the moment. I've got sitting, <laughs> listening to the madness out the window as we have our, um, uh, as we call it, as we locals call it, al fiasco, al fiasco dining rather than al fresco dining because it's completely like a zoo out there. But there's something about Soho which the energy of it is really an extraordinary place. I didn't know when I, I've always been very. I mean, I've worked it. I've been coming up to Soho since I was 14 years old. My sister used to work for Paramount Pictures. She managed, we were both film buffs, and she managed to get a job there, um, in, like as a secretarial thing. So I've been coming up since I was 14. I've worked in Soho since I was 19, and I've lived in Soho since I was in my 30s. So for me, it's very much in the fabric of my being. And actually what I discovered, which was I found mind-blowing, was that I have a, a distant cousin who I never really knew 
until the wonders of Facebook brought us together. And he's introduced me to a whole number of things, including the fact that one a member of our family used to run the Greyhound pub on um, Old Compton Street, Three Greyhounds. I mean, that was like mind blowing to me that actually there was something deeper rooted. But Soho is very much about a kind of a state of mind as much as anything else. And that's why when people talk about, I mean, I, I belong to the Soho Society and Save Soho, we're always battling the changes or whatever. But the underlying essence of Soho is something that you that you can't really kind of quantify in a way. And Michael, because he was born into there, you know, literally he's born on Poland Street, right? Pretty much next, Tony, to where Mr. Young's preview theatre is, right? That, that round there. 25 Darbley Street. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so, he was, uh, so he was born here, and I think it does seep into you somehow. There's a cosmopolitan quality to the area, I would say, I have to say, I think it's a very Jewish thing. I'm not Jewish, but everybody assumes that I am because it so permeates my soul that, that what that's about. And there's something which is, ah, God, it's like joyous and entrepreneurial and, uh, and creative and financially, you know, astute as well. It's a kind of extraordinary combination of things. And I think Michael's whole journey through that from literally sleeping under the table of his dad's, you know, pressing you know, the, the pressing machines or whatever there to kind of working in the clubs and the bars and so on, which, of course, have their own energy and still do to a large degree. I think it just creates something really quite unique. It presses something quite unique into you. And of course, Soho has always been absolutely associated with the film industry that the, the first person to set up shop was a guy called Charles Urban who had a pioneer colour film company and he set up in Wardour Street and if you go along Wardour Street you will still see a place called Urban House that carries his name and that people moved it you know that the film industry moved in I have a cranky theory about this I can't remember I'm probably I'm being boring because I'm probably talking about stuff that I think was in the film but I have a cranky theory about this that Soho has always attracted people who make things violin makers instrument makers um that that the, the, there was all the Huguenots when they were expelled from France came and moved into Soho they were silk weavers basket weavers and film people moved in as well it's weird it's like this it sucks people in like a black hole and of course, a lot of film editing companies and things moved in. So it's always had this kind of extraordinary quality. It's always had this raffish quality, as as we all know. The old uh, the old uh, description of Wardour Street is it's the only street that's shady on both sides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was always this kind of feeling of people coming in, making films, doing films, doing deals, or whatever. So I think Michael had that absolutely in his soul from where from where he kept where he was born and where he came from and when it came to the films and so on that kind of energy and particularly if you like that slightly you know because he started in what you would describe i think fairly tony as the sort of exploitation-ish sort of area films that were not they were they were not sex films but they were films that were marketable in that way that Com the compton group was involved in and so on so to take that kind of energy that he had and then recognize an incredible talent in Polanski and say, but what I need you to do, Roman, is a film that's in this area that I can actually go out and sell and do something with. I think that's very interesting. And I think that go that carries right through the films. You look at something like Get Carter, which is without any question still the best British gangster film ever. I mean, it's like that there's nothing that will ever touch it ever. But that kind of film that had that kind of incredible energy and the fact that he recognised that this kid, Mike Hodges, you know, like, who'd done, like, TV stuff but nothing else, that it just kind of this smell that he's one of us. He's the kind of kid that's going to be able to get this kind of energy that this area represents and that we bring to these things. And to see it through in, the t in what, eight months from conception to release or whatever, I mean, it's an amazing story. Yeah. So Soho is a very important part of what Michael is, I think. Don't you, Tony? I I, I well I think 
in every which way yes um the, the, the answer, i think we you're only allowed on this panel if you've got no hair i think <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I try and make up for it <laughs> that's Wolf, that's wolfie with his clippers he was kind of just getting very <laughs> what, what what michael had which i say in the film and it's absolutely true he was very deceptive because if you talk to him he's very avuncular he would crack jokes and he was very good at that and uh, but underneath that was he had total recall which people didn't know he didn't tell people that and i mean genuinely could remember everything like a photograph and the other thing he had that was unknown to most people but colin picked up on it was he was an extremely well-read very sophisticated person with a very cosmopolitan sort of continental kind of view uh, which he fortunately gave me you know the films he showed me when i was a kid said go and see this go and see that were films that other people weren't watching like you know polanski pasolini's ever really you know the, the, uh, stuff that um, when you talk to other fr my friends they go what what are you talking about uh, they weren't watching that stuff and it was what was informing him as a person and so when i say in the film and, and it's again true he could quote you from dostoevsky and, and shakespeare and People go like, oh, yeah, sure. He could. He really had that part of him. And the thing that uh, Colin touched on, which I think was an essential ingredient, was both his humanity and the realisation that to get to make the good stuff, he had to sometimes do the exploitation stuff because otherwise you, 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 don't, you, you, you couldn't afford to make those films unless you had some money. And yeah. He, the thing that informs something about him, which is, I think, very, I think, very relevant, was his his thinking was the best film he ever made was Cordesac, not Get Carter. Yeah, and he thought that the best film that could have been was Shout the Devil, but he thought the director blew it. Um, but he he well, he, which he, he kind of did. It was still a good film, but it could have been so much better yeah. in his heart. That could have been Gone with the Wind type of thing, and. What made him the person he was, was as important as the producer he was. You couldn't, that's why I didn't make a film about him making films, I made a, or, or a film about him as a person. It's the two things were inextricably linked. When he found film, after being an engineer and a nightclub guy and all, he found his metier, he found where he was happy. And- Tony. I think it's really important to make that point that he's an accidental filmmaker. Yeah. This right. isn't somebody who set out with a passion to make films like you, you see so many people. He he did it because he couldn't get films to put in his cinema club uh, yep. because it was too close to all the mainstream cinemas around and he, he couldn't get content. So he... And, and I think it's an important thing about creative people and the way that they're driven by the constraints around them very often. And the best work comes out of those constraints rather than when there is freedom. He was forced into this situation. He was forced to find a solution to it. And because of the clever man that he was and the natural storyteller that he was, he fell into this world of filmmaking, which was completely made for him. Yeah, I, I I think that's absolutely 100% right. And uh, the funny thing is I always get asked, oh, so you got into films because of your father, which is totally not true. I, I wanted to get in films way before he got into films from when I was a little boy, because I was that guy that wanted to be in films from the age of seven or eight and, you know, writing competitions and things like that. And so when somebody says, oh, you followed him, I, I go, no, he followed me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was so upset when he went into the film business. And I actually said to him as a small boy, what are you doing? That's what I'm going to do. And I, I couldn't bear it that he'd gone into the film business. Um, and we, we actually went our separate ways. And later on, I realized, you know, it's that story, you know, when you're a young boy, you think what a fool your father is. And when you're a few years older, you think, oh, he's learned a lot. That's exactly what happened with us. When we actually went into partnership together when I was 34, 35, I'd done some work with him, some films, but this was actual partnership. I suddenly realized, wow, he's really, really good at this. He's really <laughs> 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 and actually it was very nice because he thought it was nice things about me too. And it was that realization of 
oh wow, he's like the best script editor I've ever read, you know, ever worked with. He was, I mean, just fantastic at it. He could see. And the thing he did, which he did in films and in scripts and in businesses, was to see the things that weren't there. Yeah. It's very easy to get, it's mm -hmm. very easy to criticize, oh, you've got the comma in the wrong place and this bit's wrong there. He literally could tell you, well, if you thought about that and that bit that's missing, then you could do this. And he could do that. And even people like Polanski, who was compulsive, obsessive, and a complete loon in some ways, even he listened to him. He yes. might have liked it. Uh, but And those people he worked with, the one thing you can say about Polanski, Mike Hodges, Peter Collinson, Alistair Reed, all of them had in common. They were very good at their jobs. They were really excellent people at their jobs. And he managed to get their respect because he was very, very good at his job. Can I, can I just say that the other thing is that you look at the films that he made with those people and that's where you really judge it because those films are, I think, the best films they made. And the, 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 it's a very peculiar role producing because nobody knows what it is. And quite honestly, I, uh, Tony and I both get asked this all the time, what is the role of a producer? And you go, well, begin or end? Because it's kind of everything from psychiatrist to, you know, kind of financial guy to whatever. But the truth is the great producers are really, really, really shape the film and work with someone. And often that comes out of incredible conflict. I mean, it's often brutal what goes on. But you look at the quality of the work that emerges and you can recognise when a good producer is involved with a good director because the quality of the work really, really soars. Whereas you look at other stuff and you see the director was completely out of control or indulged or he didn't have he didn't have a creative sounding board. He didn't have the, the financial sounding board as well to do things. And I think that the, the fantastic thing about Michael is you look at all the work and it's, you know, as you say, it's unfortunate when there's a battle over, I mean, what the, the, it is a shame that Shout the Devil is not as good as it could be. It's still a good film, but you can smell that there's a better film had he been able to really sort of get down. But sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. He got Polanski at a moment where he, Polanski really needed him, right? And, and that therefore he was really, con he was willing to be, to work with him. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I th well, one of the things that it, it, I think it comes, I think I say it in the film, was that during the making of Shadow the Devil, my dad had a heart attack and we couldn't tell anyone. And I had to step in and I was 24, just about able to hold it together, let alone like <laughs> do what he did. Uh, but, you know, keep it going, keep the, th keep the show on the road. You know, we had like 2,000 people working in the film in four or five countries. So it was, I, I, I was pretty happy that I was able to keep it going, ticking over. And he came back uh, after about a few weeks. And, you know, this man had a heart attack and he just carried on like nothing had happened. And I, 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 it was either incredibly brave or incredibly foolhardy, but it was also the disappointment he had because the guy hadn't, the director hadn't done what they'd agreed to do and done it differently and all that kind of thing. Uh, he, he never really got over that. He never, he never f w felt happy about it at all. You've gone quiet. Oh, oh Colin, yes, we've we've lost your oh, sound, your Colin. Gone. Your mic's gone. Don't seem to be muted though. Oh, that's that sounded like something. <laughs> no, oh yes, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, he. Um, I think because Shout of the Devil for him probably was a launch into another phase of his career in a way, wasn't it? And yeah. so obviously it's doubly disappointing when that sort of, when that some, an event like that happens. I mean, it is unfortunate as well that sometimes you have to say that those bigger films are really difficult because so many other things kick into the equation. As a producer, there's, you know, it's just as simple as the fact that you've got more limited resources or whatever, and you have more control. So when you have great control over things, as he did with, particularly with uh, the Polanskis and with Mike Hodges' film, Penthouse, which is a very powerful film, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's, it's a contained film. That yeah. these things are contained. And I, I, again, I would say to my sort of dying breath, that with things like the Confessions films, that what was, you see when he was really able to be on it with the first film and have a bit more sort of influence or whatever, whatever you think about those films, 
that's far and away the best of the series because they and and that a lot of that is the creative aspects of it because he recognized that what made those films work was the family stuff and those kind of connections and they lost that they didn't really i don't think god bless him greg the producer was a lovely man but he was a finance guy he wasn't a creative person in that way and little norman smith was kind of not exactly a genius either i mean he was a kind of perfectly competent guy but you didn't have in the you know you didn't have a, the, the ability that someone like Val Guest, who'd been making films since the 30s, the 1930s, to, that he brought to the table, but also Michael's real influence on those things. Yeah, I was really struck, I was struck massively by, and I highly recommend if, if people can get hold of a copy of it, alongside Tony's excellent film, that um, Andrew Spicer's book, The Man Who Got Carter, is fascinating because of the material it, it shows. And one of the things I thought was fabulous in that were the annotated script pages from Baby Love, where you really see Michael's creative instincts. I was like, I'm looking at this stuff and thinking, as a producer, because that's what I do, I came out of project development, script development, but I'm looking at his notes, which are so on point in terms of character and the precision of that. And this sort of uh, this misunderstanding that some people have that a producer is just the guy that turns up and is saying, Don't, you know, I'll rip the pages out of the script if you go over budget or whatever. That's not what Michael was. Michael was a, was a storyteller. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, he was. And and it, you're, funnily enough, I, I was with Andrew Spicer filming this week in Bristol. And, oh, right. And I, I, and I agree with you. The book he wrote of the same name, The Making of Get Carter, I mean, the man who got Carter, rather, which I gave him that title, by the way. So it's not that I didn't pinch it; I gave it to him. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that that book is a very, if, if you can afford it. Uh, I've I've been trying to get the price down for everybody, but academic books cost a lot of money. Um, it's a very very good accounting, and that you can look it up on the, the Michael Klinger Papers, uh, which is the University of the West of England put there. But you just type in. The Michael Klinger papers is www and you'll see it's got a massive amount of information about him as a filmmaker really um, and the incredible detail he went into in development and pre-production and scheduling and budgeting I mean he, there was nothing he didn't know about putting a film together literally to the point it kind of it was it, I, when I worked with him I couldn't believe it he literally would hold a script up and go Two million five weeks. <laughs> and I go, what are you talking about? And then I'd do this whole amount of work for computers and it would be two million five weeks. <laughs> he just yeah. knew his stuff and did it in a charming way. That, that that's the, the I I was the fortunate uh, son. You know, people you know, I hear the angst and the terrible childhoods they had. I had a golden childhood. We went from where I was born in Hackney in 14 years via seven different moves, like the Isle of Wight, Stoke Newington, West Acton, etc., to Grosvenor Square in 14 years. Hmm. I mean, that's not normal. <laughs> it's like, you know, and but the values I got were from Hackney. The values I got were very, very solid working class social democracy you got from soho initially though that was the yeah. thing yeah. <laughs> yeah it was it was but and and that thing you said about soho people think of soho as it is now it was actually kind of different then i remember as a child uh going obviously i was there a lot and it was kind of that part of it was like a jewish village and then yeah. there was an irish kind of bit an italian yeah. kind of bit and it was totally continental. It, yeah. uh, people speaking foreign languages like they do now, but it was then Italian, Irish people speaking with, with an accent at least, and 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 Jewish people speaking Yiddish and Polish and Russian and everything. And it it had a flavour. The it was kind of like a, an English Damon Runyon book. Yeah. It or, yeah. or New York's uh, you know part of New York. It wasn't like the rest of London. 
still isn't like the rest of London, probably enough. No, it isn't. And in lockdown, that sort of re-emerged because it was just us. Uh, we always call, you know, we call ourselves villagers yeah. because it is like a village. And that in lockdown, you just met the people who, you know, you saw the people who lived here. And that's still an incredible, and that's why I say whatever they do to it, however much they knock down a building or put up some, you know, a Starbucks or whatever, there's still a, a fabric underlying Soho which is really unique and it is kind of it's a little, it's a it's a little square mile it literally is is bounded by you know Oxford Street Shaftesbury Avenue Regent Street and Charing Cross Road and it is something unto itself and i think it does it it, it can't not affect you in some way or another and it is still the home of kind of low lifers and high lifers and dreamers and all the rest of it and all those things that michael sort of like represented for me that he certainly was part, he was part of part of him and he was part of it yeah so, uh, interesting to ask paul a question because paul you're the one of us that didn't ever know him and yep. so i wondered what you've got from this because you became very closely associated because you were working with us on it for a long time what what did what's your impression George? Your, what's your takeaway probably my biggest takeaway ironically was it was an education in how to make films just following his work through the, the yeah. clinger papers there's phenomenal depth in there uh, of reading through and i i went from a relatively naive filmmaker probably at the start of the process um in terms of i knew my bits and i knew my areas and i could do do my things um into a much wider understanding of how the process works and all the things that you needed to pull together to create that successful picture at the end of it it, it's an incredible. He really is like I. I you know would say Tony's film and Andrew's book are like as almost as much of an education as you need. Of course, there's all these. You know, now the world has changed. There's streamers. There's you know things have changed in that way. But the underlying thing of passion and a, and finding a story and recognizing how you put people together. I mean, as a producer. I always feel the most that just as much as casting a film, it's casting behind the scenes. It's finding the cameraman and the crew and the editor and all those people. And Michael just had a great gift for do, for doing that. And I think that that you could learn you would learn so much about how he recognised what you could do and how you could go about doing it and how you achieve something in with the maximum kind of speed and efficiency. And quality as well. Well, quality above, above and beyond everything else. Because I, I think that the idea, you know, churning films out, one of the things that slightly depresses me about the, the current climate is we are, we're, we're kind of like, we're not much further on from the dreaded quota quickies of the th of the forties when they introduced this scheme, the quota scheme to make British fund British films that now, because all the streamers need new content. Every time a new streamer comes online, they have to produce new films. I, I mean, I'm benefiting from that to a degree. I made a film for Netflix last year that's one of the 72 films that they're going to put out this year that they've said, because unless they keep producing new films, people go, oh, I've seen it, what's on there. I'm going to go, I'll, I'll lose that subscription and go to something else. But I think that to keep the quality level as high as Michael kept it and to really say, yes, I'm in the business. I'm in the business of film, but I want to make things that I actually feel proud to have my name on. And that's a really big thing. Let me ask you a question, Colin. Can I just sorry. ask you a question? And, and uh, just, sorry to cut you off, Paul, but I, the question is this. When we, I was talking with Andrew Spicer uh, this week, we were, uh, it, it's almost unbelievable, but it's true that Michael never, except for his own money, his own company's money, got finance for any of his films in England from English companies. Yeah. Or always from foreign companies. Why would yeah. you say that was, was? Because he was very successful. I don't understand why it was. I think that, I think that God, you're, you're, I mean, all I can say is I really understand it. I've rarely made films with British money. I mean, it's like everything I've ever wanted. I mean, I've worked for American companies. I've worked for international companies. i work, you know, for government agencies when I do things like the British screen and so on. But the truth is that the kind I found uh, the, the British side of things very conservative. And there's a kind of a, it's just a quality that I've never liked, which is, 
and I think this is what Michael loved with the, with, with the American, is that if you're going out, and this is dangerous because it can be misleading, but if you go out internationally, and certainly if you go to America or whatever, everybody wants to meet you because they're afraid of missing out on something. Whereas the default British setting is, oh, we know who we're working with and we don't really want to be bothered with other people. And a lot of that, and I'll say this as a chippy person, as a, as a lower middle class boy, is that a lot of that comes out of the whole sort of Oxbridge thing, that unless you went to Oxbridge, Cambridge, unless you were part of that establishment, certainly in British cinema, in the in certainly at a certain point, and, that, and the way that British television was, it was very much you only got a job at the BBC if you came out of Oxbridge. You became a story editor and then you became a producer. Many great producers and many great films came out of that. But if you were working in the rough and tumble of the film business, it was much tougher. It changed with the swinging 60s in a way and with the fact that American companies recognised, like Paramount, recognised, oh, there's something going on here, so that you could go, so I mean, I, I guess that my, Michael did uh, the penthouse, didn't he? But was that for Paramount? Or yeah, he, did you he get made it independently and then sold it to Paramount. For a million because dollars. Paramount. It was the first million dollar film sale from England to America. And that presumably led to kind of Paramount's interest then in, in Peter Collinson for the Italian job and things like that after that. Yeah, every, yeah. every single person on the, on, in the above the line got a three-picture deal, except Michael, who turned it down. Except Michael, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to say that I think he was just swimming. I think, first of all, his taste was just that thing of going for directors that were not... The overwhelming thing in British cinema for years, and this is why, I, and I always felt like um, estranged from this, was British was social realism. That that was the dominant quality that, that that pushed British cinema along. And that when and I obviously didn't know any of this stuff when I was a kid, and I'm ten years old, and I watch A Matter of Life and Death, which is obviously a very interesting mixture of this high Tory British guy and Michael Powell from you know upper class, all those things, and this rough and tumble uh, Hungarian Jew in Emmerich Pressburger, and that this combination of them two, which, which the Alexander Korda, as also a Hungarian that was an import into the British system, recognised, produced something that was so unique and extraordinary. But of course, Powell and Pressburger were considered really vulgar. British critics hated their work. They thought it was the most vulgar thing. Red Shoes, that, well, that's morbid, you know. Canterbury Tale, that's this awful thing about a gloomen pouring glue into women's hairs because they're fraternising with American troops. These obsessions that they had about this kind of stuff. And Michael really, like, by tapping into people like Polanski, who obviously came from that European tradition, that's not a British film. <laughs> you know, it's like immediately it becomes something else. And I think I think Michael always had that slight outsider thing, didn't he, that he recognised. And because of that, and because also, probably, I don't know, but in the boardrooms of companies like Rank and EMI, a bit pushy and a bit whatever, and a bit of a sort of like, he's not one of us, he's not having dinner at the Ivy every night. You know, this is the Ivy when it was the old school Ivy where everybody went to. He's kind of somebody who's like just around the edges and he's pushy and he's different and that it becomes much harder to be absorbed into the system. And I love him for that, of course, because that's where I felt like I've made my career. I, I've always felt like I've been appreciated most in the work that I do in America or in Europe rather than in, in Britain. Yeah, I think that's all correct. And I also think him being an, an, an avowed socialist and, and telling people that if they would listen uh, didn't, didn't really help with the establishment. <laughs> <laughs> I think as well there's a couple of the risk of putting me on a hobby horse because I spend as a filmmaker a lot of time working with young people and developing young people in what they do what one is there's always that battle that the creative industries are a hobby rather mm -hmm. than actually a, a real job which we have in this country and, and we're still fighting massively at the moment. And the other thing is that, that that whole Soho thing about having a mixture of creative people in one environment. You've got songwriters and the music industry up against film up, and those accidental meetings that happen. And, yeah. and my example of that is the reason Tony and I 
uh, worked together is because we accidentally met at a meeting of Becky's, having yes. worked together about 10 years before <laughs> in the educational world and sat down next to each other and kind of went, I know you. And it, it's those networks and that ability to meet with people that we have to work really hard on now. Whereas when there was a community of people all sat working in the same place in those different industries, that kind of evolves organically and those exciting developments of people working together uh, produced really interesting work. Uh, and I think it's something that we've really got to work on, particularly our poor souls at the tail end of our career to make well, sure that there are still those opportunities for people. One other thing I'd just say about what you were saying about your dad never looked, you know, with money from England. The other thing about your dad is that he was absolutely a trailblazer. It's interesting that um, many people now talk about a producer I adore. He's a great friend and I think he's a genius, Jeremy Thomas. But yeah. Jeremy was is generally considered, and I'm about and I'm about to say this is not correct, but he's generally considered to be the trailblazer in Britain. In that, when he did, for, he st starting with around the time he did the Last Emperor, he made a deal with Terry Glynwood, a sales agent, and he sold the project territory by territory, and and pulled money together from a group of people from around the world to do it. Now, as Tony is smiling and knows perfectly well, that's what his dad did. That's where he started off. Kind of, He knew that he could go out and he'd raise money by selling. He was way ahead of that game. 15, in terms of 15 years ahead, maybe. Yeah. And also, I remember the first time you went to the Cannes Film Festival and put booths there in the carton, and no one else had a booth in the whole Incredible. festival. Um, and and the people were saying, "What are you doing?" He said, "Well, I'm going to be selling my film." Is it like a market trader? He went, "Yeah, exactly like a market trader." <laughs> <laughs> that is so out of like like. There's something so deep seated in his psyche about that, and it's yeah. so brilliant. Yeah, well, it certainly was worked and became like a festival hall now. <laughs> with yeah, well, yeah. market yeah. traders. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, now, of course, the irony is that this is pretty much dead. It's very now. difficult. Now, the pre-sales market because it's all about doing a deal with Netflix or Amazon or Apple or whatever and selling everything in one go and if you don't get into that I'm here to tell you it's very tough I mean I've been very lucky in that I did a film for Netflix last year but I have I have a couple of other projects which I'm doing the old-fashioned way and it's a really tough market because most people are going out of business that they don't have a lot of money everybody is running scared nobody knows exactly what's going to work and to do what Michael did, to, you know, to take someone that had made, had a success in the, in the case of Polanski at Venice, which was a, you know, it's a prestigious festival, but to say, oh, I've got this great project by a guy who won a prize at the Venice Film Festival. It, it's going to be tough to raise that money on that film territory by territory. My favourite story with him, and it's a true story, is that at one stage I was making a little film. I can't even remember what it was I was making, a little film. And he was making a film, and we were in Pyman Studios after Rank had just reneged on their four picture deal with him. And he turned around and he said, You know, the irony is, as we were <laughs> urinating, he says, We're the only two people in the country. We're making half the films in the country at the moment. And there was only four films being shot in the entirety wow. of the UK. Wow. Wow. Oh, absolute craziness. And um, we're going to have to bring it to a, an end, even though I feel like there's probably a series of chats about how the film <laughs> industry has changed, um, you know, the state of industry now that we could do. But um, thank you very much for, for giving up your Friday evening to, to talk to us. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's so interesting. I think it's interesting as a film watcher, it's interesting as a filmmaker. And I, yeah, um, I really recommend the documentaries. I hope you will go to our to our website of the Northampton Film Festival uk and have a little watch of it while it's available till Wednesday. But thank you very much, guys. I'm going to um, let you get back to your to your Friday nights of listening to Al Alf, Alfrentic Soho. No, I can't what you said now, but <laughs> Al Chaos Soho. Al Chaos. Yeah, that's very nice. I'll, I'll um, go out with my hose in a moment and spray them outside. <laughs> watering the roof terrace brilliant <laughs> thank you betty no thank you very thank much you, um, yeah. yeah thank you and thank yeah, you I'm... for making such a great film and paul for doing such a brilliant job with it as an editor it's really fantastic thank you very much thank you. yeah definitely brilliant well um i will um i'm gonna 
slightly pay attention when I when take it off. But yes, Tony, thank you very much. Really appreciate that you've given Northampton Film Festival the premiere of Sisters and and the premiere of the, the fully online, I'm going to say, The Man Who Got Carter as well, because that's, yeah, really appreciated. And I hope people really enjoy them. Thank you. So do I. And thank you very much for your hospitality. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you. Great. Brilliant. Um, and so, yes, thank you very much, everybody. I hope you keep enjoying the festival and, um, yeah, watch all the amazing documentaries right until the end of the festival. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So please um, give us a hashtag Northampton FF if you are on that kind of social media or Facebook or YouTube under these videos, which will be now online forever for you to have a little watch of. Thank you very much. <laughs>